Hello, and herzlich willkommen to another episode of the Butch Deeper Podcast. Today's guest is Larry Wolf, a professor of history at New York University. Much of his work has been focused on European identities, especially across Eastern Europe and the former lands of the Habsburg Empire. In this episode, we discuss a range of topics stemming from his recent book, The Shadow of the Empress, Fairy Tale Opera and the End of the Habsburg Monarchy. Topics include the legacy of the Habsburg dynasty, the collapse of empires following World War I, and the importance of opera in the late 19th century, including many more. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. More info on Larry Wolf can be found at the links in the description. Enjoy. So you grew up in New York City, and you have gone on to become a European historian focusing on many aspects of Central, Eastern, West, even Western European identity. How would you say that growing up in New York shaped your interests in history and what was it like? So I didn't actually grow up in New York, Luke. I was born in New York, but my parents moved to New Jersey when I was very young. I mean, New York, we, we lived about 40 miles west of Manhattan, and my parents actually still live there in that house where I grew up. So I would say that um, New York was a very fascinating place for me, but it was not someplace that I knew well or knew from the inside. Never lived in New York until 2006 when I came to NYU. In terms of shaping my interest in in history, I would say that that's something that came later in my life when I when I went to college. But the proximity to New York was really important um, for my interest in opera. It was something that my parents really cared about, and um, for them going into the city from New Jersey um, to go to the opera was a big deal, something they did regularly. They subscribed to the opera. They took it really seriously, and they took really seriously the idea that um, that their kids would be interested in opera. I was taken to the opera in New York for the first time when I was six years old. The opera to you is in part a connection to your family, but what about it appeals to you as an art form? So opera is the... In, in for me the most complete art form that is to say it combines drama it can with music with staging and is um, moving to me because of the ways that it puts all of those pieces together that's been true for me ever since i was a kid the both the spectacle of it the beauty of it and the drama of it you know come together for me the, in a way that makes it the most moving of theatrical and musical art forms a lot of the book uh, talks about the relationship shared between strauss and hofmannsthal as they're writing uh, or preparing die frau ohne schatten uh, what is the kind of process that goes into making an opera and to what extent are the musical parts of an opera connected to the narrative and written parts? That's a, that's a great question and a really deep and profound question. One of the things about Strauss and Hofmannsthal is that they corresponded in such detail that we have a pretty clear idea of how they work together, how they built the idea of the opera together. They talked about it as Hofmannsthal was writing the libretto, and Hofmannsthal talked with Strauss about the music even before Strauss composed the music. Hofmannsthal had a sense of the ways in which he wanted music to complete his text. Um, we know that this is important in a lot of, in, in pretty much every collaboration between a librettist and a composer in opera. And it's true right up to the current moment, right this moment, librettists and composers are working on composing new operas. Um, but we have very few collaborations that are documented in the same level of detail as this Strauss Hoffmannsthal collaboration. And it's one of the reasons that it's so interesting to a historian to have that kind of documentation that enables us to understand um, what they're thinking at, at every given point in the collaboration. For Die Frau und Schatten, one of the things that was so fascinating for me is that it overlapped with the period of the 
coming of and then the fighting of the First World War so that they were actually creating these this opera under very weird, terrible, and unprecedented circumstances. And that marks their correspondence and the collaboration as well. Could you kind of explain who the characters of Hugo von Hofmannsthal and Richard Strauss were and why they're important in the context of this era? So Richard Strauss is the probably the German composer who is most important in German music in the post-Wagnerian generation. Wagner dies at the beginning. Wagner is the great you know, titan of romantic German music and especially romantic German opera. Wagner composes almost exclusively opera. He dies in the early 1880s, and by the late 1880s, Strauss is emerged on the scene as a young genius composing in what we would call a post-Wagnerian mode, making use of Wagnerian orchestration styles in a, what uh, not, not a, a romantic, but a late romantic um, form. He composes tone poems, very famous ones like um, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which is familiar to many people, um, especially from its opening chords. But beginning in the early 20th century, he turns to the great Wagnerian genre of opera and begins to think about what he can do as an opera composer and will become the most important German opera composer of the post-Wagnerian generation. Hoffmannsthal is a, di a very different character. He's 10 years younger than Strauss. Strauss is German. Hoffmannsthal is Austrian and very specifically Viennese. And his career is a very unusual one. He's discovered as a poet while he's still in high school. He's 17 years old. And the verses that he's writing, people felt then, and people would probably still agree, German literary critics, among the greatest lyric poetry in the German language for the late 19th, early 20th century, um, which is really extraordinary to think of a high school student writing poetry at that level. He's some kind of very precocious genius and perhaps like many precocious geniuses, undergoes a writer's crisis, a crisis of creativity in his 20s rethinks his life, gives up writing lyric poetry, and turns to drama, um, which brings him into the world of libretti. Strauss discovers his dramatic writing, and they initiate a collaboration together. Strauss, um, in some ways, the um, more powerful and forceful personality. Um, Hoffman's still younger, more reserved, a little more nervous about what he's doing as a librettist. Um, but it turns out to be a really beautiful match in which they understand each other very well. And each one pushes the other to do a more complicated, more interesting work so that the collaboration is really more than the sum of its parts. And much of the book is centered around how this specific piece by the two of them reflects the changes in society and in government that are happening at the time. How aware do you feel that the two were of the changes that were taking place around them and kind of what were the flashpoints of the change from empire to a more national system at the turn of the, eight, of the 19th and 20th centuries? Clearly, it would have been impossible not to be very much aware of World War I, the most terrible war in European history to that point, taking place all around you if you're Strauss or Hoffmannsthal between 1914 and 1918. Um, there's no way they could not be aware of that. Although one of the things we can see in the correspondence is the ways in which they try to take a certain kind of refuge in their work. Perhaps Strauss especially, because Hoffmannsthal is actually more explicitly engaged in the war effort. He's working for um, the Austrian War Ministry. He's writing official essays on behalf of the Austrian government during this period, what we would call wartime propaganda. So he's very involved um, in a very explicit way in the 
um, the ongoing war. Though at the same time, the work that he's doing with Strauss is a little bit of an escape from that, a little bit of a refuge from that, but certainly marked by the ongoing war. In terms of a world being transformed, what's most interesting to me in writing about this opera is it's an opera about imaginary fairy tale emperor and empress. And what Hoffmannsthal and Strauss would have been very well aware of when they started on this project in 1911 is that they lived in a world of emperors and empresses. There was an emperor in Vienna, there was an emperor in Berlin. Strauss was German, Hoffmannsthal was Austrian. Both of them were born as subjects of emperors. Neither of them would die as the subject of an emperor because the empires were abolished in the interim at the end of World War I. And again, that's something that they had to be aware of the, the political structures in which they were born, had grown up, had developed as artists, were both endangered over the course of the war and then radically abolished at the end of the war. And for this particular opera, that's very significant because an opera about emperors and empresses becomes something very different when it's produced in a world where emperors and empresses no longer exist as political figures. Another key figure that you follow throughout the book is Empress Zita, the final empress of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. How does she fit into this story and why is she such a crucial figure? The argument of the book is that to think about Hoffmannsthal especially and his interest in emperors and empresses means taking into account the real life emperors and empresses of the late Habsburg monarchy. In the opera, Hoffmannsthal is interested in the ways in which emperors and empresses can be meaningful in the early 20th century, the ways in which they can connect with their subjects and play a meaningful and humane role. Karl and Zita, as the last Habsburg emperor and empress peculiarly corresponds to these imaginary fairy tale figures Hoffmannsthal is, is writing about. Not to say that he has them in mind, but he's imagining people like them who might assume the role of emperor or empress um, at some time in the future or at some moment in the fairy tale past. Um, it's a fairy tale opera, so it could be happening at any particular time or outside of the chronology of normal human history. So for me, the most interesting thing in writing this book was to try to tell a parallel history of a real emperor and empress who are struggling to define a meaningful imperial role for themselves during the last years of the war, and an imaginary emperor and empress who are struggling to define a meaningful role for themselves within the context of the opera that's being composed during the war. I've got a special interest in Zita because I played a small role in the ongoing cause for her beatification. I served on the Vatican committee that was gathering historical material about Zita in preparation for considering her beatification within the Roman Catholic Church. So I was very aware of her um, as a historical figure, and I would say even in relation to her beatification as a little bit of a fairy tale figure. And one of the interesting things to me was that even after the fall of the empire, there was a large interest by Zita to keep her faith and connection to religion. And the connection to religion is clear throughout much of the Habsburg history. Why does religion play such a big role for the Habsburgs? And uh, how does it play a role in their existence today as post Habsburg empire uh, figures of this past? Going back to the age of the Holy Roman Empire when it was first founded um, in the year 800 um, by Emperor Charlemagne, the first Holy Roman Emperor. The 
um, role of the church is really important. Charlemagne is crowned as the Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope in Rome on Christmas Day of the year 800, some 1,200 years ago. The idea behind the Holy Roman Empire is that it's the old ancient Roman Empire renewed in Christian form. The moment when the Habsburgs assume the role of Holy Roman Emperors in the 15th and 16th century, it's very important to them as well. This Christian aspect of their um, imperial roles. And the Emperor Charles V in the 16th century makes himself into the defender of Roman Catholicism. In this case, um, Roman Catholicism engaged in struggle with Protestantism across Europe. And from the 16th century onwards, the Habsburg dynasty will be one of the um, crucial defenders of the Roman Catholic faith in this ongoing struggle, which sometimes becomes actual warfare um, in the 17th century, especially um, with Protestant Europe. In the 19th century, um, when there's no longer warfare going on between Catholics and Protestants in Europe, the Habsburgs look to Roman Catholicism still as a unifying force within their empire, especially at a moment where they see their empire um, as one that contains multiple cultures. They think about Roman Catholicism as something that might unify peoples who might have different national identities. They see religion as well as culture and including opera as potentially unifying cultural forces. Franz Josef in particular, who was the emperor of the Habsburg, within the Habsburg monarchy from 1848 until his death in 1916, immediately preceding Karl and Zita, looked to the public performance of ritual Catholicism as one of the unifying stylistic themes of his imperial rule. And this piety was very important to Karl and Zita as well during the period of their reign from 1916 to 1918. They were both devout Catholics in the tradition of the Habsburg family, in Zita's case, in the tradition of the Bourbon family, because she came from the, the Bourbon family, which ruled over France for um, up until the French Revolution and even for a little while on the, in, into the 19th century. Um, she came from the Parma branch of the Bourbon family, and Catholic piety was very important to both of them. It was one of the foundations of their marriage. Uh, for Zita, it remains um, part of her life. She um, has a lay affiliation with a convent from the 1920s on when she's a widow. She spends a certain part of her life um, for large parts of her life in the convent as a, as a lay person um, living a life of prayer for a part of her year. And her sense of herself as a Catholic is, I think, also inseparable from her sense of herself as an empress, which was difficult for her to maintain over the course of 70 years when she was no longer a ruling empress, but maintained a sense of her own imperial title for herself and for her children. I think one of the most interesting things that stood out about Zita was her ability to kind of adapt to life after the empire and living not only abroad elsewhere in Europe, but after or during World War II coming to the United States and starting another life as well. Uh, how would you describe her adaptation to life after the fall of the Habsburg Empire? And what do you feel is Zita's overall legacy? That's, that's, a, that's a really great question. If we were looking at the ways in which Zita adapts, part of it is simply a question of figuring out how to raise a family of eight children as a single mother who considers herself to be the empress. It's a, sometimes a financial question of who is able to provide support for the empress mother of eight children. Um, for a while in the 1920s, she's in Spain. For a while in the 1930s, she's in Belgium. She is someone who is both 
able to adapt to different circumstances, but in a certain sense, never adapts. That is to say, never quite adapts to a modern world in which she is not the Empress. I show you in the book where she signs her um, alien reg her alien registration card upon emigrating to the United States. I have a copy of it that I found in the American archives when I was doing this work for the beatification cause. She signs her name, Sita, Empress of Austria, Queen of Hungary. She always thinks of herself that way. When asked many years later, did she really think that she was still the Empress of Austria 50 years after she was no longer the Empress? She said, she, she's supposed to have replied, man ist was man ist. You are what you are. And so in a certain sense, no internal adaptation is ever made, even as in certain external ways she has to adjust to living in new situations, dealing with new political realities, um, a post-imperial Europe, then a Nazi Europe from which she flees, then a wartime situation in which she sees perhaps misguidedly, new possibilities for the Habsburg family, and then a long post-war period in Europe where she actually doesn't return to Austria until the 1980s because she's unwilling to renounce the idea of herself as the empress. How would you say that the Habsburg idea or that the Habsburgs are held in regard by public in Central and Eastern Europe today? And it seems that they're viewed more fondly, but at times it can also be this harsh criticism of monarchical power. Uh, where do you find that the opinion lies? Great question, and connects to the question you asked me before, which I didn't, didn't actually properly answer about, about Zita's legacy. Um, so here's what I'd say about this. Um, by the time Zita dies in 1989, most people were surprised to learn that she was still alive. I can remember people saying to me, but didn't she die decades ago? There she was still alive at 96. And if I were to say what she meant, what her legacy was at that moment, and there was a mass funeral for her in Vienna. Tens of thousands of people came to the funeral in Vienna when it took place. We're there in the streets of the city. We're there in the streets of the city to mark the occasion of her funeral in 1989. I would say the legacy is not so much as political as nostalgic in the sense that Sita connects us to the world of our grandparents. At the, I mean, Sita connects me to the world of my grandparents. My grandparents were Sita's subjects when she was the empress between 1916 and 1918 in Austria-Hungary. And that's true for a lot of American immigrant families, but it's also obviously true for people who live in the former lands of the Habsburg monarchy, who live in today in Austria, Czech Republic, um, parts of Poland, um, Slovenia, Croatia, Hungary, the Habsburg family in the nine in, in 1989 would have connected them to the world of their grandparents. Today, it would connect them probably to the world of their great grandparents, and that means different things to different peoples. For people in Western Ukraine today, there the Habsburg world of their great grandparents is a reminder that they were always connected to Vienna and to Europe, never connected to Moscow. That's something that's patriotically meaningful to people who live in Western Ukraine. And um, immediately after Ukrainian independence in 1991, you saw Habsburg memorabilia going up on the walls as a reminder of that connection. And I think it's meaningful in different ways, in different parts of the post Habsburg successor states today. In most cases, it's 
really not about political nostalgia for recreating a monarchy. I think that those would be, you know, very small segments of the population today who would be interested in recreating a monarchy. But I think there are many peoples who look with either sympathy or fondness on the world of their grandparents or their great grandparents. And there are many, there have been many moments in the later 20th century when people have come to a reappraisal of their feelings about the Habsburg monarchy, say during the periods of communist rule in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, um, Yugoslavia, during the Cold War. There were peoples who might have looked with some sympathy on the Habsburg world that was lost um, after the after the First World War. It's interesting because in a lot of in many of your former publications, you discuss the idea of Eastern versus Western European identity and how those identities were created and shifted over time. How do you feel that the Habsburg family and the Habsburg Empire fit into that overall story of Eastern and Western Europe and to what extent does the idea of a central Europe even play a role in that? I would say that the Habsburg monarchy back in the 18th century would have crossed the territories that we think of as being East and West. And there are even moments where you can, you know, read that in the, in the texts of the late 18th century. There's a great text in which Mozart travels from Vienna to Prague in 1787 and makes up um, funny nonsense names for himself, his friends, and his family because he's hearing a Slavic language as he travels. It's a language he doesn't understand. Mozart is someone who's governed by his ear, and the sound of a strange language um, encourages him to imagine new fantasy identities for himself and his traveling friends on the road from Vienna to Prague. Road to Vienna, from Vienna to Prague, I should say, is a travel road that moves you very slightly to the West. But for Mozart, it's a journey into Eastern Europe in which he acquires a new identity. Um, he says, um, I am Punky T T T, making up a new name for himself. During the 19th century, we can see a little bit of an, especially towards the end of the 19th century, a little bit of an idea of Central Europe growing up around the Habsburg monarchy. Um, the term being used for the very first time in some documents of the late 19th century and the early 20th century to describe the territories and the role of the Habsburg monarchy, a central Europe, which is neither Western nor Eastern. Here, Eastern would reference Russian, with the Habsburg monarchy occupying territory in between. And I would say that when the, the new Central European idea evolves in the 1980s during the late Cold War, especially in a famous essay by the Czech writer Milan Kundera called The Tragedy of Central Europe, he looks to the Habsburg legacy as defining a new idea of Central Europe with no connection to Moscow, no connection to Russia. The idea of the Habsburg legacy is meant to define Central Europe as something which is um, different, distinctive, and emphatically not Russian. That was important to Kundera in the period of the late Cold War, and it remained important to the identity of a number of the post-communist countries which had been part of the Habsburg monarchy back at the beginning of the 20th century. I feel like the term colonialism is rarely used while discussing purely European uh, politics or history, but to what extent do you feel that colonial ideologies being imposed to various colonies to create an, a sense of civilized society or civilized culture, as it was called, how does that compare to the identification of an Eastern European identity, which was very often seen as backward or needing of catching up to the civilized Western European identity at the time? So I think that for many people in Vienna, especially, 
there is a civilization idea of imperial rule in which the eastern lands of the Habsburg monarchy um, learn about civilization from Vienna and um, you know acquire civilized aspects from their relation to the imperial capital. Now, mind you, I think there might be people in New York today who would feel that way about New York in its relation to um, you know the United States, and there are probably always people in large metropolitan cities who feel that their city determines the civilizational level of their country. But within the Habsburg monarchy, just as you say, there's a little bit of an east-west dimension to this sense of Vienna's civilizational importance. Certainly Hoffmannsthal felt that way, and part of it was snobbism. And part of it was literary refinement. And part of it was a way of trying to understand the nature of the very mixed cultural state that he was living in, the state of Austria, Austria-Hungary. So I think that you can identify that as being something meaningful that was a part of Austria-Hungary before the First World War. You mentioned the similarities with New York. I was curious if you feel that experiencing the vast diversity that exists on the East Coast, uh, I'm from New Jersey myself, I apologize for missing that early on, but um, do you feel that experiencing the immense diversity here has allowed you to better understand the highly multinational region of Southern and Eastern Europe and Central Europe uh, throughout your studies? I totally do feel that. Um, Living in a city where um, I think a hundred languages are spoken in New York, in in New York City, um, that combines cultures in the way that New York does, um, does, I think, give you some sense of how complex multinational empires were to navigate in the world of the early 20th century. One of the things to keep in mind about New York is that it's a little bit of a Habsburg successor state itself. That is to say, there was a very large emigration out of the Habsburg monarchy that ended up in New York, as in many parts of the United States. And there are um, parts of New York that feel like parts of the emigre Viennese world, people who left um, you know, Nazi Vienna after 1938, including my own family, who ended up in New York and recreated a piece of the post-Habsburg world here. If you were to go to the famous Neue Galerie Museum on 86th Street and 5th Avenue, um, you would have a little piece of the old Habsburg world recreated for you here in the city, including the cafe right? The the sweets, the coffee, the decor of the old Habsburg world. So were these all things that kind of pushed you to making this book? What, what were the influences that made you interested in telling this story early on? And kind of how did that develop? It emerges from the centennial of the opera. I began thinking about this in 2019, which was the year of the centennial of Die Frau und Schatten. I went to Vienna for the performance of the, of, of, of the centennial production. I wrote about it, and I began to think about it in relation to Zita, who, as I've mentioned to you, was also a, a, a separate part of my life through my work on the Beatification Historical Committee. And at the same time, the third piece for me, and I've suggested this already to you, was the piece of my family history. The fact that all four of my grandparents had grown up as the, were born as the subjects of Franz Josef and lived between 1916 and 1918 as the subjects of Karl and Sita. It was a reminder to me that that imperial world really is the world of my grandparents and of many people's grandparents. And the three pieces that I wanted to connect in this in this book were Habsburg and Viennese history, the history of opera, 
and the family history piece, which is my family history, but also many family histories for um, people living in the United States as the for in, coming from immigrant families or people living in Central Europe who in the world of the Habsburg successor states. With such a multidimensional background to this book, how did you go about researching and compiling everything? And also at one point you came across these photos of your grandparents at the same spa town as um, Sita and Carl. How did you find these photos and were there any interesting bits to the research that surprised you? The photos are family photos. They're, you know, part of my mother's, you know, photo, photo collection. I was um, actually surprised uh, when I saw that photo of my, not my grandparents, those were my great grandparents in that, fro in that photo of the spa town of um, Franzensbad or um, Frantisko Velazia. It's in the Czech Republic today. I was surprised to see, I turned it over and saw on the back Franzensbad that it was coming out of that same spa town where Carl and Sita began their romance in the early 20th century. And it was a reminder of the ways that emperors and subjects were connected through the territorial spaces of the empire in the early 20th century. So um, the photos come out of my, my mother's photo box and um, photo album. They're family photos that she's had, you know, with her, um, you know, since her parents' death. I was a little surprised um, by some of the things I found in um, Sita's FBI file, for instance, when, um, and I didn't write about this. I wrote about this a little bit in the book, but there were people who were um, who were disconcerted by Sita in America in the 1940s during wartime, who were concerned about the um, her claims to rule over the countries of Central Europe, some of which we were thinking of as potential friendly connections um, in the war effort because they were occupied and oppressed by Nazi Germany. And when the Habsburgs began to try to form an Austrian battalion in the United States during the Second World War, this was, you know, concerning to um, some people who contacted the FBI about it. So there was more, you know, suspicion and concern around Zeta than I would have predicted if you look at the, at the FBI file, which would be, say, one piece of the archival work. I was, you know, again, a little surprised at when I came across the immigration documents by how firmly Tsita clung to her titles in her immigrant status in the United States. Writing the book was actually a, the question of materials was a complicated one for me. I was writing this book during the pandemic. It was, you know, my pandemic project. It was part of what I was doing to try to stay sane during the worst part of the pandemic in 2020. And I was using materials that I either had on my laptop that I had already collected or that I could carry around with me in books in a suitcase as I moved from place to place during the pandemic, but didn't have a lot of access to the wider world during that period. It was a little bit of project that I carried around with me on a laptop during a very stressful and difficult period in all of our lives. In the uh, dedications page of your book, which you dedicate to your daughter, Josephine, you also list three quotes by Napoleon Bonaparte, and they're brief, so I was going to read them really quick for those listening. It, they are, uh, nothing is more difficult and therefore more precious than the ability to, the ability to decide. Uh, never interrupt an enemy who is in the process of making an error. And finally, glory is short-lived but obscurity lives forever. What do these three quotes mean to you and do they have any significance in regard to the book? There are quotes that are meant to be reflections on what it means to be an emperor, um, which is its significance for the book. Put it on the dedication page because my daughter happens to have a Napoleonic imperial name. That is to say the same name as Napoleon's empress, Josephine. So I thought she would like that. 
in terms of the reference to the book, they are references to trying to think in a pragmatic way about it, what it would mean to be an imperial figure in a modern age. Sita herself would have had no patience for Napoleon, whom she would have regarded as an upstart, um, someone who had um, made himself emperor as opposed to a legitimate emperor or empress that would be herself or her her husband's Carl. But I thought that Napoleon's imperial reflections were interesting in relation to thinking through what it may, means to be an emperor. How do you feel that emperors of the era compare to autocratic leaders and dictators of today? So I think there's no comparison between the emperors of the late Habsburg monarchy and autocratic figures or dictators today. Franz Josef, the Habsburg monarch um, um, in the late 19th century, was a constitutional monarch who's um, from 1867 until his death in 1916. That was true for Karl and Sita as well. Between 1916 and 1918, they were constitutional um, emperors in their Austrian realms, constitutional king and queen in Hungary. And it would make more sense to compare their role to the role of the British monarchy than to think of them in relation to the dictators who succeed them in the Habsburg world. Say, Horthy in Hungary in the 1920s and 1930s was far more of a dictator than one would ever have imagined the Habsburg king being in the later 19th century or the early 20th century. Um, if you go back to earlier centuries, obviously, 16th, 17th, 18th century, kings and emperors play um, have much greater authority. But that would not only be in the Habsburg monarchy, that would be all over Europe. The Habsburgs at the turn of the century, uh, how did they compare to the Habsburgs earlier on in the long lineage, and why do you think that the Habsburg dynasty stands out so much from the other dynasties throughout European history? So the Habsburgs um, as in the late 19th and early 20th century are different from their ancestors because they govern constitutionally. They have limited imperial and royal powers. They work together with a cabinet of ministers. There is an elected parliament with um, very important government powers. By the end of the Habsburg monarchy, there's universal male suffrage in the Habsburg monarchy following um, 19, 1907. So that's a very different world from the world of their Habsburg ancestors. If we were thinking about the very particular mystique of the Habsburgs, they're a very long-lived dynasty um, going back for centuries, and they also rule over, I think we could say, a particularly complex empire because of its many different cultural groups, many of which identify as distinctive nationalities and more and more so as you move into the late 19th and early 20th century. A particularly complex empire to govern. And one of the things that's interesting about, about the Habsburg monarchy is that they engage with the complexities of a multicultural or multinational empire and try to think through what it means to balance the con collective concerns and interests of different cultural groups. And the cool and admirable thing about the late Habsburg monarchs is they see themselves as being non-national impartial arbitrators among the different cultures, religions, and nationalities who make up their imperial space. And they try to be um, impartial arbiters over, a, over the, these complex spaces. They learn multiple languages, right, including the, the most difficult language of all in the monarchy, which is Hungarian. I've never learned Hungarian myself. It's a really hard, it's a hard language, not related to most other European languages. And the Habsburgs try to be above nationality themselves as they um, try to work within the framework of their complex polity. What lessons from the book and also just generally from the fall of the Habsburg Empire and the transition to a more modern system do you feel are the most important for readers to take away or 
are the most relevant to our present day society? I think that the lessons for present day society are probably in some ways close to the lessons that a historian has to take away from the study of the late Habsburg monarchy to not be too quick to judge that monarchy, to take seriously its efforts to engage with the problems that it faced, to understand the ways in which monarchies and empires were trying to um, adjust to a modern world at the in the early 20th century. I wrote a book about Woodrow Wilson and Eastern Europe before I wrote this book on um, The Shadow of the Empress. And there's a Wilsonian moment following the World War, World War I, where um, perhaps, you know, spearheaded by Wilson, lots of people believe that the abolition of empires um, is the hallmark of modern political development and the ideal solution to the political issues of Central Europe, um, the replacement of empires with national states. I think that within a generation, people were already nervous about uh, and critical of the Wilsonian solution to the um, imperial issues of Central Europe. That is to say, the national states have problems of their own. National states could involve, evolve into dictatorships. National states could be very intolerant of national minorities, national states could become the victims, small national states could become the victims of larger political forms like Nazi Germany, for instance, um, in the period leading up to and during the Second World War and the Soviet Union following the Second World War. So um, I think that um, we should be cautious in our appraisal of national states as the ideal solution to um, political problems. And it's one of the things that takes us back to the Habsburgs and their determination in the late 19th century and the early 20th century to be a to try to be above nationality, to try to transcend nationality. Um, and it's one of the things that I think is worth keeping in mind for thinking about politics today, that most political states involve many different cultural groups and almost inevitably involve cultural minorities, and that national states have to be particularly sensitive to the um, situation and concerns of their minority groups. Earlier, you had mentioned that you're very involved in the process of Empresita's beatification. I was curious what that process is like, what it symbolizes, and how you kind of got involved with it. Very involved would be an overstatement. I was involved in a small way with the process. I received an invitation in 2009 from the people who were beginning the cause for Zita's beatification. They were collecting archival material um, connected to Zita's life to accumulate archival material and think about what kind of life she had lived. This is quite apart from the question of, you know, miracles, say, which are very important for thinking about beatification and canonization. This was a purely his, historical spade work of putting together archival materials to understand the life of the person in question. And over the course of some years, I did some of that archival work in the United States trying to understand how Zita had lived during the period when she was in the, U the United States and in Canada as well. She lives in Massachusetts, she lives in New York, she lives in Quebec from 1940 basically to the end of the 1940s into the, into the post-war period. And I collected those materials and submitted them to the committee that was gathering these materials. The Die Frau ohne Schatten is being performed uh in San Francisco from June 4th to the 28th. What does it mean to you to be able to go see this opera in person in the US? And uh, how do you feel that the opera fits into the context of today? 
So it's an opera that's about um, redemption, humanity, um, thinking about the relations between those who rule and those who are, are you know, ordinary people, um, trying to understand um, the relations of ordinary people to governments and what it is that makes leaders humane and worthy of um, participating in political leadership. It's all told in fairy tale form. It also has gorgeous music and um, spectacular settings that are going to be recreated and uh, um, created in San Francisco by the artist David Hockney. Um, anybody who has a chance to go see this in San Francisco should certainly do it. San Francisco is using it as a festival opera to celebrate their own centennial as an opera company this year. 2023. And it's a festival opera because it requires an enormous amount of effort and resource to put on. It's a, it's a complex work with multiple scene changes and a large number of complex starring roles. Um, San Francisco was the first city in America to produce this opera in 1959. It's the first place I ever saw this opera in 1980 when I was a graduate student living in California doing my PhD at at Stanford. Really excited that it's coming back to um, San Francisco in about two weeks. And I'm really excited both to see the opera there and to lecture. Yeah, I'm going to be giving a lecture at the San Francisco Municipal Library in relation to the production that's going to happen there. Very exciting. Urge everyone who has the chance to go see this in San Francisco in June to do it if you can. It's really an extraordinary thing, this opera. That's exciting. I hope it's, I hope it's everything you expect it to be and more. Um, so thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. The book was so interesting to read, especially as someone who is not very familiar with opera, as I said, uh, and I hope that you enjoyed being on. Thanks. Really appreciate your thoughtful questions. They were great. Thank you all for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, keep an eye out for new content across our various social media platforms. The Botschieber Institute for Austrian American Studies promotes an understanding of the historic relationship between the United States and Austria, including lands of the former Habsburg Empire, by awarding grants and fellowships, organizing lectures and conferences, and publishing the Journal of Austrian American History. We engage with a broader public audience through digital programming, including videos, podcasts, and blog posts. Auf Wiedersehen, and see you next time.